Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. I hope everyone is doing great. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your last part of the test number seven that we conducted on 10th of April. So in this particular video, we will be discussing the last 20 questions from 81 to 100. We really hope you have enjoyed the first four parts, and I'm really looking forward that you guys are practicing enough for the upcoming prelims. If you have still not started the preparation of the prelims in terms of MCQs, I would recommend you guys to check out our test series which is available at a very special price of 499 and the, uh, these 1000 high quality MCQs can actually boost up your score. The link is given in the description below. Do check it out before you leave any comment in the box. So. The very first question of this video, that is question number 81, was with respect to the INSAT. What, what exactly INSAT is about? So the INSAT is Indian National Satellite System, INSAT. So uh, there was a group of information that was asked and you were supposed to figure out which statement is correct with respect to the INSAT series, okay? It's a very important series when it comes to uh, the telecommunication, uh, uh, a lot of other, uh, you know, metrology and all these fields. So it's a very important series of satellites that India has made so far. So the INSAT, it's a group of multi-purpose satellites. But what type of satellites? They are geostationary satellite. Many times, UPSC is going to confuse you here. If any satellite, if it is a geostationary satellite or it is geosynchronous satellite. It's a very common way that UPSC can trick you out. A geostationary satellite orbit is somewhere like this. If this is your Earth, if this is your Earth, so this is how just above the equator, we have the orbit of a geostationary satellite. It is just above the, like, you know, in tune with the earth equator and that to at a height of approximately 36,000, precisely 35,786. Now, when it comes to, because, because it's, it's very much synchronized to the rotation of the earth, it appears to be geostationary all the time because its position is exactly on the top of equator and its rotation, its revolution time is same as the rotation time of the earth. So every time it is going to be appearing to be stationary. Whereas geosynchronous is also very much similar, but there's one difference. Instead of, instead of revolving exactly on the top of equator, a geosynchronous satellite is going to go like this, slightly inclined, okay, rather than exactly above. So this is geosynchronous and that is geostationary. So remember the inset series is a geostationary satellite that we have. Now, if any satellite is put into geostationary or geosynchronous satellite, the main purpose of such kind of satellites are, is always going to be telecommunication. I always say remember the three very important orbits. The if any satellite is, you know, orbiting the polar areas, then such polar orbiting satellites are going to be used for uh, what you say as a remote sensing purpose, for the remote sensing purpose and all that. If any satellite is geostationary or geosynchronous, the purpose is going to be telecommunication, broadcasting, metrology, uh, search and rescue, always. It's, it's, almost, it's almost a very important fact that you guys need to remember. In INSET series, we have launched a lot of satellites. INSET 1, way back in 1982. Then we got INSET 2, INSET 3, and so and so forth. So we have got many. There is a complete list in front of you. There are so many si uh, satellites that we have launched under the INSET series. But presently, at present, there are two operational meteorological satellites that we have under the banner of INSET. So it is INSET 3D and 3DR. In fact, because of these satellites, India gets weather update every 15 minutes through the 3D and 3DR. So both are functioning very well. They are operational perfectly and giving us update every 15 minutes. Of course, the two have some slight differences as well. Like for example, uh, the 3D is a little bit older that we 
uh, launched way back in 2013 and 3DR is what we launched in 2016. Of course, it is, uh, 3DR is more advanced. It is more advanced in terms, it, it uh, gives you more information like for example, uh, uh, information of uh, outgoing long wave radiations or the sea surface temperature, the snow cover, cloud motion. There are a lot of new features that, that we have been added. But the point here is that right now there are two operational satellites for, for, the, for, the, uh, for this particular purpose. Now if you look at the question, the first satellite, uh, the first uh, uh, statement, look at the third statement first. It says, the, the statement says, at present, the only operational satellite is in, inside 3DR because 3D ceased to function in 2016. That is not the case. It is still functioning. 2016, we got 3DR, but even the 3D is functioning very well. So there are two operational satellites. So clearly this is wrong. And I just told you the inset group that we have, is it geosynchronous? No, sir. It is geostationary. So I told you, these are the possible areas where UPSC is going to trick you. Now, if you talk about any, uh, any of these satellites, especially the satellites which are in the news for some reason, do expect at least one or two questions coming on the space and satellites, especially the Indian satellites. It's a very famous and very important uh, area where UPSC targets, right? So first one is wrong, third is wrong, the right answer is supposed to be two only. So answer, how many correct? Only one, sir. Uh, level of the question, I would say it was a medium level question, could have been attempted easily because these are very, very important uh, facts that you guys are supposed to remember, especially with, with, uh, in, uh, you know, with respect to the inset series, the, uh, the resource set series. At least you should be fully aware of important Indian satellites. In case you have no idea, but still there are at least two statements that you can still figure out with some logic. So at least try to take a little bit of risk and attempt these kind of questions. Don't skip it altogether because once you, once you try to recall, it's an Indian satellite, you still has a chance to get it right. So don't skip it altogether. But the next question is of very tough and difficulty level. Why? The question says, the question is with respect to the white rhinoceros, right? And it says which statement is not correct about the white rhinoceros. First of all, guys, they are not very much endemic to India. So automatically, I'm not supposed to have a by default kind of a knowledge about the white rhinoceros because they are endemic to Africa. Okay, so this statement is correct, but we have to figure out which statement is not correct. Now look at the options. It says the white rhinos, also called as square lipped rhinos, due to their square upper lip. How am I supposed to remember that? I mean, this, this, you can't guess it up. It can be true, cannot be true. And I'm sure many of you must have thought that this is incorrect, but the, actually this statement is correct. Right, when it comes to the IUCN status, so the northern rhinos, they have the IUCN status as critical endangered, where the southern rhinos are near threatened, this statement is also correct. But what, my, what I'm trying to say, is there any logic I, I can apply here? No, sir. Absolutely, absolutely no chance of any uh, guesswork that I can think of. This question, purely and purely factual question, pure fact-based question, right answer which is not correct is this one because white rhinos are only grazers not even the white uh, grade one you know, they are the only one that feed exclusively on the short grasses they are the only category of their type there is no there is no buddy uh, that accompany them in in this category so this these white rhinoceros they always feed exclusively on the short grasses they are the only one in this category only grazer of their type so this question was very tough one. Am I supposed to attempt it? Only if you know the answer. Don't take the risk, please. Skip it if you are not in a position to handle this question. Tell me how can you solve it without any factual knowledge. It becomes really tough. So this, these kind of questions are actually challenging, guys. Very challenging. Now, why it is in news? You may have, a, may have an MCQ just by understanding the context why it is in the news. Recently, the scientists in Berlin, they announced first successful embryo transfer in the white rhinoceros. And that explains, this context explains why we have added this question. And why at least out of all the five types of the rhinos that we have, all the five species, 
at least you need to read about this rhino specifically because it is in news and that also for some great scientific development right white rhinoceros remember they are called square lipped rhinos because of their square upper lips two species one is southern or white rhino one is northern white rhino and of course uh, they are the second largest land mammal after the elephant that also you need to remember as a star mark point this already i've explained they are the only grazers out of the there are total five rhino species but they are the only one that feeds exclusively on the short grasses right now very interestingly uh, if you look if you look at their IUCN status, I already mentioned that even northern one have a different species, southern has a different species, guys, right? Okay, now that takes us to the next question, which is question number 83. Question 83 is with respect to the Citizenship Amendment Act, very much in news way back the when, when it was announced in 2019 and very much in news even today because recently the government has already rolled out this plan. That time government passed this act and now the government has impl implemented this act, ratified it, implemented it just few weeks before the general election. Of course, there is a political timing behind the Citizenship Amendment Act, but we are not supposed to be on that political ship. We are supposed to learn it from the UPSC perspective. Okay. Now, few things that you need to remember about the Citizenship Amendment Act, then we'll come back to the main question. How many statements are correct? That's the major goal. So, Citizenship Amendment Act, as the name says, so we have amended the already present uh, the act that we had and the standard act which was there with respect to the Citizenship uh, Act, it was the 1955 Act. So, this time, and it is, not the it is not for the first time, the Citizenship Act has been amended. Already, it's been amended six times, including the, the recent one. So, we already have amended, look at the timeline. So, we have uh, amended it n number of times. But this time, we have not just amended the Citizenship Amendment Act. Please remember, many, very few people know this. This time we have amended, along with Citizenship Act, we also have amended the Passport Act and we also have amended the Foreign Act. And that's make things little complicated in this case. Second statement when you will read, you need to understand, remember, normally there are like four to f there are like five uh, uh, you know five cases or five ways anybody can get indian citizenship out of those five ways as uh, mentioned in uh, representative people act as mentioned in uh, citizenship articles in the constitution also like there there is one particular uh, way that is of naturalization earlier if anybody wants to be citizen of india he or she needs to be present in India for 11 years, right? And uh, then they were they they could have been given the citizenship, um, uh, 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 this uh, you know the way of naturalization because you have already contributed a lot towards the Indian society. The best example of naturalization is Mother Teresa, the, uh, because we have given her Indian citizenship based on her work on in, uh, in India for so long for so many years. Recently, the amendment to 2019 amendment, it has relaxed that requirement from 11 years to just 5 years. If now you are only in India for 5 years, then also you, 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 you are likely to get the citizenship by naturalization. But this is added only as a specific condition for Hindus, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi and Christians, applicant from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh. The central government exempted them from the foreign acts and the passport entry act and that's why these two are also amended. And that is a major change for the first time in the history of citizenship. This is a major change that we have seen so far. I hope that this particular thing makes things very clear. Now, also something very unique has happened this time. Unlike the constitution, this 2019 act actually defines the term illegal immigrant. So far, there was no proper definition or a legal definition of what exactly illegal migrants are. But 2019 has clarified under the CAA, it clarified an illegal migrant is going to be a foreigner who number one, 
enters the country without valid travel documents like visa, uh, like a visa passport etc or number 2 enters with valid document but stays beyond the permitted time so both cases both categories are going to belong to the illegal migrant category and remember one thing this particular bill also excludes illegal migrants residing in areas covered by six schedule because those are the tribal areas and in six schedules we have the tribal areas of assam tripura meghalaya mizoram the atmm states and also it also excludes the illegal migrants that are there in 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 the inner line permit so of course we are not going to disturb these two areas because that was a major concern especially the northeastern states of india they were they were very much concerned like if you are allowing so many people to come to india and giving them uh, you know citizenship where you are going to settle them and there were all the apprehensions and concerns by the northeastern states that probably maybe those people are going to get settled in those particular areas but now the government has shot that all these illegal uh, migrants that we are now granting the citizenship they are not going to be uh, settled in any of the six schedule area or any of the inner line permit area that is that is that is the thing which we have clarified of course it's not like anybody can come and we are going to give them citizenship that's not the case these people from these six particular religious communities specifically from these three particular countries and those who have entered india on or before 31st of december 2014 also they are not in certain tribal areas the six scheduled areas that we have mentioned guys and not the inner permit line areas inner permit line is a line where uh, the non tribals or non natives are not allowed to enter without permission in those particular states that the idea is to preserve the native population from the non native uh, any kind of disturbance or something like that so in in the states like arunachal mizoram manipur nagaland we have inner light permit even today so also remember you may have a question on this also do prepare inner line permit very well you may have a stand alone question coming on the uh, ilp and also try to remember the name in which particular states we have the ilp understood now if you look at the question the only problem with the question was this and this is a very obvious uh, uh, you know very factual error which was mentioned here so instead of 11 years now the time period is not 7 it's been reduced to 5 years we just have learnt so citizenship amendment act number 1 is correct 3 is correct 4 is correct second is not correct of course this question is based on factual and conceptual it's a blend of both so i would say this was a tough question but you could have taken a risk because the the statements are very obvious statements and i do not expect you to going to the exam without reading caa which is a very burning topic right now so you can still take a risk and at least try to solve the answer get somewhere closer to the answer the right is answer is c here in this particular case Question number 84, what this question 84 says, let's try to break that up for you guys as well. Question 84 is about the WTO subsidies. You know that, gov uh, that the, the World Trade Organization, WTO, it, it actually categorized all the kind of subsidies in different, different boxes. And every box is like an umbrella term and within that there are so many different different categories different different subsidies which are categorized based on if those subsidies are distorting international trade or not distorting international trade something like that is there so first it's always important and probably one of the most important concept with respect to the wto is this these box subsidies upsc has always been interested in asking questions and i have seen even in the previous year questions some questions coming from these kind of topics so please first let me make it simple simplify for you as per the world trade organization wto terminology the subsidies in general are identified by the boxes and those boxes are given the colors of the traffic light like as per traffic light just this is important the word traffic light is important if you have a green light means go you are permitted means imagine any subsidy in the green box means oh it is allowed it's not going to dis 
extort any trade, not any risk for anybody. So any subsidy under the green box is going to be allowed. For example, if the subsidy is with respect to research, training, extension, services, infrastructure, disease control, public stock holding, domestic food, decoupled income support, support to structural adjustment, anything like that, which is actually not going to disturb any kind of international trade. Then you have the ember one, the yellow light, the yellow orange kind of thing, the ember light, which says slow down, slow down, watch, watch down. That's the traffic rule says, right? So ember subsidies are those subsidies which you need to slow down. You need to reduce. There's a need to be reduced of those subsidies. They may not, may, they're not troubling the trade maybe today, but of course they are, they are distorting things in some way or the other. Even if not at a major scale, but they're still distorting in future, they may become really, really a big challenge. And then clearly if you have a red flag, the red, the red box forbidden, like the traffic says red means stop, stop it right now. So this is absolutely important, the WTO subsidies based on traffic light colors because that make easy as a reader, as a common man to understand what is permitted, what is not permitted and what I need to do with the pace of subsidies. So as I have already explained, green box subsidies are those that do not distort the trade and cause minimal, minimal distortion areas. And that is why usually these subsidies are not directly directed at any specific products. And that's why there is no limit on the government for giving this kind of subsidy. So since it is in green box, we are not bothered how the government of any country is giving subsidy on that particular field or, or that particular uh, 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 thing, right? The amber one that you have just understood, of course, they are the one distorting the international trade. Um, because how, how can any subsidy make a, make, uh, make distort the international trade? A subsidy can distort any international trade by making that product as even as, as a cheaper one, as really, really cheaper as compared to the similar products by other countries. If my government supporting and boosting my export, giving n number of a lot of subsidies on my exports and boosting my sector, of course, I can, I can uh, based on the subsidy, I can keep my value down and by default I'm going to get distort the market because my product if any other my competitor is giving 100 rupees for that product I can sell it in even 80 rupees and the difference help me capture the market so that way that subsidy that is given by the government to the exporter has actually helped him capture the market and distorting the international trade makes sense and the biggest example biggest is input subsidies subsidies on electricity, subsidies on seed, fertilizer, irrigation. So basically all the subsidies which are part of agriculture and of course, of course it includes the MSP, the market support price. MSP subsidies also fall under this category and you know these, this is where there is a, there is a, uh, you know, there is a problem that started and happened between India and the WTO where under the amber box kind of uh, thing uh, they were they were forcing and asking india to stop their agriculture subsidies and of course india says no we cannot stop the the uh, agriculture subsidies because we also have to take care of the food security we are not here just to comply with the guidelines of wto we also at back home we have to take care of the food security as well and then comes the blue box subsidy this is very special so you have understood the ember one, you have understood the green one, but what about the blue box? A blue box subsidy is like ember box subsidy, but with some conditions. Ember box, but with a star mark, with some conditions. So basically blue box subsidies are those with, with an aim towards limiting the production. How? How you are going to limit the production of any particular product when you are imposed by some production quotas or there is a requirement that you need to set aside this part of the land. So any, any, anything. So blue box subsidies, ember box with conditions where you have limitation in terms of productions due to quotas and other factors. Remember, blue box subsidies are also exempted from the calculation of the AMS, but uh, after all, you need to at least be aware of this. So now if you look at the question, 
and the question itself says a lot i mean even if you are not a champion of wto subsidies i have i have mentioned you everything let's see you are not a, even a champion but look at the three options looking at the three options at least something which is green green is supposed to be permitted no how can green is not permitted green is always we use the word green color green in a positive scenario so do you think green box can ever be that subsidy that distort the international market no green is always used in a positive sense and do you think amber can be the one subsidies do not distort the trade so it very clearly very sharply clearly says oh the two things are actually inter exchange make sense so at least at least i can figure out the two statements being incorrect blue box yes this is little bit tricky it is about the quotas you really can't guess about it for that you need to have a basic fact first two can be solved with sheer uh, what you say as a concept based kind of thing the third is more factual kind of thing can i attempt it yes i can attempt it or at least try to risk it the level of the question is somewhere for from easy to medium depending on the students but i would i would classify it as a as a easy um, category because it's a very straight forward question very face value kind of question could have been attempted with basic knowledge as well okay now that brings me to the question number 85 where the question 85 says what question 85 says with reference to ima kethal what is ima kethal now for this you really really have to read the facts first what is ima kethal why it is in news and why we need to know about it absolutely important guys you have no other option but to learn about it at any any cost now let's try to understand this uh, so called um, ema kethal why it was in news first first thing is first in january on our republic day parade we have seen a manipur tableau and that manipur tableau was having this uh, feature it, this manipur tableau featured it's a women run market in manipur there's there is a whole market run by women and that is called ema kethal ema kethal somewhere or it is also called as the thamba balgi langa which is a lotus thread a lotus silk making process now coming back to this particular ema kethal please remember this is absolutely important manipur in india it was in news for so many reasons it was in news for unfortunate violence for all the suffering the people of manipur have gone through but despite the fact manipur is a home to this one of a kind it's a 500 year old market this is crazy insane it's a 500 year old market the name is as per the local language the name is ima kaithal it is located in imphal and this market this ima kaithal market solely and only run and managed by the women and this reportedly is called world's largest all women market here the word ema ema kethal actually means mothers market it's called the mothers market that you need to remember understood guys and clearly what better than this can this is the real empowerment we are looking for this is a real this is social economic every kind of empowerment that we can see here on the in the markets the streets of manipur remember as important as like this also remember this particular market was was established way back in 16th century that's why it's almost 500 years old very interesting point this this particular market okay this sent, this uh, uh, for, uh, there was an imposition of the labor system after that this market was established now remember this imposition of labor system called the lalup La, uh, lalap kaba it was a forced labor system in manipur kingdom that actually required male member of maithi to work at a distant lands and that is why because all the men all the male member especially the maithi community they were actually forced to work as a labor as a consequence women had to support their households by cultivating their fields weaving the textiles and finally selling the products in the market and that is the history this because of this kind of requirement we have got the world's biggest all women market 
in fact very interestingly if there is any male trader that goes there and do any business male traders are absolutely prohibited this is even crazy if there is any male uh, uh, goes there he or he is going to get penalized if any male or any men is found operating in the market it is of all women market strictly keep it all women market absolutely amazing concept with absolute amazing history in this case guys all the four statements are absolutely correct answer is d all four level of the question mm, i would say yes uh, it was a tough one it was a tough one and without fact it's purely fact based question theek hai this much i can remember i can understand i know about the northeast uh, you know society let's say northeast is very uh, it's a it's not patriarchal it's kind of matriarchal society we know about that it's a it's a matriarchal society and we have uh, women as the center of development we know that but to this extent to this kind of extent women is central part of development that's not really very easy to guess yes few points i can guess uh, considering the socio economic setup of the northeast but not like everything i mean at the face value this statement looks really weird that male traders are going to be punished if they are going to go in the market and operate i mean this looks too rigid it looks too rigid but in this case yes sir it is true it is correct so here i would say it's a tough question better to skip rather taking as unnecessary you know risk in this case all four are correct answer is supposed to be d careful with, with these kind of statements next question 86 is about that you have to figure out okay now this is purely 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 news based questions that was somewhere in january okay this was a very important historical discovery very recent this is history but purely current based history because i have seen there was a news direct news coming like this excavation of which of which one of the following sites found evidence of cultural continuity between indus valley and emergence of iron age yes guys the answer is vadnagar in gujarat very very special things we have read about vadnagar in the recent times this question sir yes sir it, it was an easy one because it's purely newspaper based question could have been attempted easily okay and remaining mohanjodaro harappa dholavira guys you have read them so many times in ncrts have you read anything like that if that would have been the case probably something you would have known even better but unfortunately that is not the case it is the vadnagar which now after this discovery vadnagar has become the longest uh, living city the largest living city it has become the largest living city of india because it stands tall from the times of iron age till today understood it has it has a very long history vadnagar historically this thing has become absolutely amazing so please remember that recently it is the archaeological survey of india asi they have found evidences of the cultural continuity in the vadnagar gujarat okay this is absolutely important and this after like i told you this now has become vadnagar you may have this question other way around you may have a question which of the following is the oldest living city of india please remember answer is supposed to be b i mean whatever the sequence is it is supposed to be vadnagar that is the right answer okay now normally normally what we uh, you know what we believe after the decline of the indus valley civilization till the rise of maha janpadas that much history in india we really do not have much so that is called the dark age dark age in history is that particular time period about which we do not have really much records but now excavations at vadnagar have really made us understand that vadnagar history falls somewhere in between this and continues even today so that makes vadnagar as the oldest living city having its presence for so many days and spread across so many areas please remember this is absolutely important topic on vadnagar very very important topic now the next one we have is question number 
which statement is correct sir that we need to figure out <clears throat> the question is about the Pake Paga Hornbill Festival you think of Pake Paga Hornbill Festival think about the Pake Tiger Reserve very very famous Tiger Reserve that we have okay in this question they have also mentioned something about a community called the Mishmi community and it also talks about the India Biodiversity Award so considering three things in your head let's try to figure out this question so first thing is first the so-called <clears throat> the Pake Paga Hornbill Festival it is celebrated in Arunachal Pradesh because in Arunachal we have a very very famous Pake Tiger Reserve and I'm sure you must have seen it on the map if you have not yet figured out so far do check it out check out all the important tiger reserves on the map of India so Pake Tiger Reserve is well famous in Arunachal so how can Pake Paga can be in any other state it is supposed to be in Arunachal only this year when the celebrations were going on for this festival this year's theme was let our horn bills remain very emotional very important very appropriate very relevant kind of theme I would say it was now please remember when it comes to Page Paga Hornbin festival it is the Naishi community this is the Naishi community that turned conservationist highlights the critical need to preserve the hornbills Naishi community is the one which is the largest ethnic group in Arunachal and they are the one taking care of the hornbills and their preservation so please remember whenever you think of hornbill you think of Arunachal it is also a state bird of Arunachal let me tell you guys hornbills are state bird of Arunachal you think about the Naishi community yes we all owe a lot to this community guys then the language is Naishi belongs to the sino tibetan family polygamy more than one wife is very prevalent practices among the Naishi community that is <clears throat> again something you guys need to remember guys and then remember one more thing like as the question says the 2016 India Biodiversity was actually goes to the Pake Tiger Reserve like I told you this Tiger Reserve itself is very important and when India got this award when this Pake Tiger Reserve got the award it is for the Hornbill Nest Adaption Program you anytime you are looking for any award don't just look at who has got the award but also why they have got the award their work is very very important guys just to give you a little bit one more information about Indian Biodiversity Awards it's a joint initiative that we do with the Ministry of Environment Forest Climate Change and National Biodiversity Authority and the UNDP United Nation Development Program so anything which is in collaboration there is always a chance on the MCQ absolutely 100% so Indian Biodiversity Award is joint initiative of which of the following so at least you should be in a position to give back some answer very important talking about the hornbills you may have a separate question coming on the hornbill guys so great hornbill as you can see very beautiful birds that you can see on your screen it's a state bird of Arunachal along with state bird of Kerala star mark point very very important hornbills they are found in the tropical subtropical Africa and Asia but still despite their presence in variety of ecosystems they are considered to be vulnerable because they are really facing threats threats of what kind threats of illegal logging forest clearance hunting for meat medicinal value etc 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 but but thanks to the Naishi community we are trying to preserve it as much as possible now, and that is something you guys need to focus upon look at the second statement the second statement says the efforts are done by Mishmi community but that is not true of course it is the Naishi community that does the best out of the best so clearly this is wrong first is correct third is also correct no problem so Pake Tiger Reserve we know about Indian Biodiversity Awards Pake Hornbill Fest we have we talk about the Arunachal very very well so how many statements are correct from this only two are correct yes sir only two only problem is with the community and very careful guys especially when you're dealing with northeastern states 
or you dealing with any of the tribal people tribal group states anything anything it is absolutely absolutely important you try to focus on their tribal population their work their job their names absolutely important clear okay now that brings me to the question number 88 question 88 was was with respect to the gift city so what is this gift city why it is in news because recently pradhan mantri the prime minister of india inaugurated the 10th vibrant gujarat global investment summit in the gift city this in short known as the ifsc international financial service center with this reference to the gift city which of the following are correct that was the question so you need to figure out a lot of important things with respect to the gift city or international financial uh, investment summit okay the first thing is first what exactly is the meaning what exactly is the meaning of international financial centers so first of all you think you must have heard about the special economic zones that we create within our country okay fine so imagine it this way the international financial service centers are nothing but it's like a like like a bigger version of multi service special economic zones that is first thing you need to remember now what is a special economic zone we have done it so many times in the past special economic zone is a is a area designated so so as to carry out specific manufacturing and trading activities and providing circumstances services not with the regular stuff also remember talking about the ifsc it's a multi service special economic zone uh, that we have in gift city in fact this is india's first offshore financial center that actually makes its relevance even more that you need to remember guys okay now another thing about other than this so whenever you you are talking about the uh, this international finance transition the ifsc you must remember one thing this can get 100 uh, 100 uh, uh, thousand tax assumption this gets 100 percent tax exemption out of 15 in any of the 10 years that whatever they want to take as an advantage that is one thing number two whenever there is any kind of interest income payment paid to the non-residents on the money lent to this which is not a taxable at all so remember that also also remember that the gst does not apply to the services you know received by the unit of unit in the ifsc so that is also true because they are not applied here in this particular product in fact gst does not apply to transaction carried out in ifsc exchange at all but gst applies to the services provided to domestic tariff areas because if you are going for domestic tariff of course there would be taxes and everything also remember there's exemption from the security transaction tax the stt commodity and the stamp duty so these are important facts i have just read out some of the important facts that you need to keep in your head and if you go by this statement so of course this question was a tough one i do not consider it as as an easy one because four question four statements all four heavily loaded with facts all four are correct but my, as an approach wise i would suggest please risk this kind of question or even if you want to take a take a risk then do it with little bit of skill little bit of logic is required without logic only risk is also not going to work in this category but very important question very difficult question very challenging one as well next question is with respect to the imd the indian meteorological department imd completed 150 years recently so let's talk about the imd at least once this is important so think of the IMD, Indian Meteorological Department, the IMD. Remember this one thing. That IMD, it was established way back in 1875. Many people will not remember this, but this is true. Indian Meteorological Department was established in 1970, 1875. And this is India's national. IMD is something we, uh, we read a lot about it in the news, right? So this is India's National Meteorological Service. It's a principal government agency that take care of all the meteorological and other applied subjects. Now, first thing is first, IMD is one of the six regional specialized 
metrological centers of the world metrological organization number one fact number two ministry the indian metrological department works under ministry of earth science that is headed by the director or general of the metrology so i don't see any problem with the first two statements now with the third statement you have to be really careful about because it, it's the third statement is actually pure fact based like where are the headquarters where are the regional center so headquarters in delhi it is in delhi and there are six regional centers that we have under the imd uh, in chennai gujarat kolkata mumbai nagpur delhi and all that stuff right now please remember one more thing why all this chaos is around uh, uh, this this whole thing so indian metrological department is important for you to have a reading at least knowing the functions what exactly is done by imd like for example initiative launched by imd is national framework for child services panchayat mausam seva portal mausam app the mausam gram decision support system called the dss so there are lots and lots of things we have done so far of course there are a lot many things to do but that is again very important guys the next question number 90 is with respect to the medical termination of the pregnancy act called the mtpa that we have amended in 2021 now which statement is correct with respect to this that is something we need to figure out now why it is in news first thing is first recently this whole new pregnancy law was in news because the delhi high court permitted a widow widow to terminate her 29 week pregnancy though she had crossed that 24 limit week limit mark this is important normally normal at, at in a very novel scenario any women can adopt to uh, terminate their pregnancy within the first 20 weeks it's their choice after 20 weeks till 24 this extra 4 weeks are given only in some of the special cases if the lady is having some complications with respect to the baby or mother health or maybe uh, you know if the if if uh, the lady is a survivor she is a she is a rape victim let's say or, or a rape survivor and she is pregnant because of that rape in that ca case also a 24 limit is permitted but please remember this is not a hard and fast this is this is one thing that is there but right now the the real news was when there was a 29 week pregnancy was terminated by a widow understood this is important so now but of course to do that course, there needs to be written permission that that is also true a written consent of the guardian required for the termination of pregnancy in two cases number one women below age of 18 you have to have your guardian along with or if there is any case of mental illness irrespective of the age person should be accompanied by any sane person that is again important please remember one more fact another fact is this so called mtpa it allowed the termination due to failure of contraceptive devices it allows also like i told you if and not just this 20 week for the married that is fine special case 24 but you know the latest the 2021 bill actually allowed the unmarried women to also have terminate their pregnancy for this particular reason and to carry out the whole procedure all the state and the ut government should constitute a medical board there has to be medical board and within that it is the function of the medical board it is their function to provide a decision within 3 days this is absolutely important meal medical board must take a decision within 3 days whether to go for a abortion or not to go with abortion so every state every ut must have their own medical board absolutely important clear everyone now please look what the question says the first statement says here the third one is very obvious it says that the medical board to recommend decision within 3 weeks 3 weeks is too long 3 week you can't wait because it's already at risk pregnancy so max to max there can be 3 days 3 weeks is too high so can't be the right answer even first one is not right because uh, it says the question says 
a woman with mental illness not allowed to terminate pregnancy in any case no sir no that's not the case of course she is allowed to terminate the pregnancy even a mental ill patient is also allowed to terminate the pregnancy yes of course with some medical assistance and everything else but it's not because this first statement is too rigid it's too hard where it says the woman with a mental illness not allowed to terminate at any cost of course for that cannot be that is never a purpose of making a law the law is to make things, uh, things simple not complicated so remember that this is important guys okay this is so in by if you go by that category the first wrong the third wrong only answer is number 2 so how many of them are correct only one is correct sir only one is correct so first i can solve with my common sense the third also because three week is too long how it is how it can be done okay and yeah for the second one you need to have some knowledge of the fact but the first and the third little bit conceptual questions so the medium uh, the medium the level was medium i would say but something you can easily could have taken the risk with some common sense and some common logic okay this was my question number 90 any problem any doubt you so far you can let me know in the comment section box that takes me to the question number 91 just a wait just a minute i think just let me uh before i tell you this just give me one minute guys and question number 91 the question was with respect to a uh, very very famous uh, uh, you know history figure which is thiruvalluvar so why this question of course this question has its relevance for so many reasons the question was with respect to thiruvalluvar day thiruvalluvar saint is very important from your historical perspective because he has written some of the finest works uh, in indian literature in tamil literature yes so you need to know certain things about thiruvalluvar and his work first let's get on to that and then we'll come back to the question so whenever you are reading about the history especially the tamil history one thing that you must and must read is about thiruvalluvar who was he a an ancient saint poet philosopher right and you know this particular one person he gave the five jewels required for a country like he he clearly mentioned what exactly you require to make a country that is no illness wealth good crops happiness safety and security and this these were very unique ideas of the time in fact he discarded the birth based caste system and very importantly several scholars had concluded like mostly most likely that he was a jain neither a hindu nor a dravidian but that is not important because what he believed that he always said the society has to be above this so called birth based caste system that was his opinion why is remember today now if you look at the work that he has done first let's talk about the work you talk about tiruvalluvar he is the author of one of the finest work in indian literature that is thirukkural this thirukkural also called as normally it is also called as only kural this is the primary work of thiruvalluvar and this particular book this kural actually considered to be the first book on ethics in india it includes every aspect of life including the ethics the governance love spirituality please remember that but be careful he has nothing to do with the tamil epics the sila padikaram and mani meklai these are the two most famous tamil epics that we know so far and mani meklai is not associated with tiruvalluvar as the question says in fact you must know that mani meklai one of the greatest one of the five great epics of tamil sangam literature this was composed by kula vanikan sithalai satana uh, satanar probably somewhere around 2nd century 6th century mani meekli has nothing to do with tiruvalluvar one important point also the whole work of tiruvalluvar in the form of tirukural the tirukural is divided into three main sections that includes number 1 the aram which is virtue the porul which is wealth and number 3 the inbam which is called the love the whole thirul has three division three sections very separately talks about the three different aspects and the three different moods 
now you now you understand the stature of this figure right so considering that after pongal celebration this this there is a festival that we celebrate on on his name and that regular uh, regularly like between 14th and 16th century uh, we celebrate occasions which relates to tiruvalluvar in fact valluvar year is an officially recognized tamil calendar system that is that is prevalent in tamil nadu even today so please remember everything is good and everything is fine with respect to this particular question where we talk about tiruvalluvar day celebration as mattu pongul everything is fine perfect only problem with statement number 3 i just told you money makele is not associated with tiruvalluvar so please prepare about the tiruvalluvar it's very very important topic uh, of ancient india that you must prepare absolutely important guys so in this case only three statements are correct i think this question was was a medium level question because this is very very famous and we have read about the mani makele the sila padikaram tirukural very important works so clearly you can you can uh, eliminate this answer could have been attempted because it's a straight forward direct question from the ncert book right now question number 92 is with respect to the psych, uh, exercise cyclone okay it's a joint military exercise between which of the following now this is purely purely fact based question exercise cyclone is between india and egypt do i have any guess work no sir this can be this can only be attempted it was a tough one because it's a straight forward question a fact based question you know it then only you can solve otherwise no scope of the guess work so you can take a risk if you have some idea otherwise don't attempt it with without like the like just like that and you need to know certain important exercise which were in news like for example start with the exercise cyclone it's a joint military exercise between india and egypt the second edition we have recently held in january 2024 in egypt this is also important sometimes the question may ask you the recent edition because normally what happens in the bilateral things one edition is with uh, with the that uh, that that is organized in our country another one is in their country so the second one that we got which it was held in egypt objective very clear of in like like any joint military exercise it's all about familiarizing the both sides with special operations especially in desert and semi desert terrains just to get the uh, understanding and just to get the acclimatization of how we are supposed to work and conduct the operations in those kind of conditions that's why it is there but other than this other than this uh, exercise cyclone between india uae we have de as exercise desert cyclone please look at the difference if it is only cyclone it is egypt if it is desert cyclone then it is india uae another small twist if the exercise is exercise desert but not cyclone exercise desert night then it is going to be between indian air force french air space force united arab emirates air force it's between the three country india france and uae okay india france and ua that is exercise desert night and then between india kyrgyzstan we have exercise kanjar exercise sada tansik is still easy to remember somehow that stands for saudi arabia india saudi arabia i would say absolutely important topic four star can be asked in one way or the other please do read about these defense for uh, you know joint exercises question number 93 is related to leprosy which statement is not correct that's what they are asking so be very very careful with that so what we need to know about leprosy first so talking about leprosy leprosy in general that few facts you need to know leprosy is a leading cause of the permanent physical disability and has been classified as one of the neglected tropical diseases called ntd okay now despite the who announcing it as eliminated still globally it is still a global health problem because more than 2 lakh people are diagnosed uh, diagnosed with leprosy every year and over half of these cases unfortunately are detected in india so india is becoming or has become kind of new capital of leprosy unfortunately but that is true 
what we need to know about leprosy leprosy also called as the hansen disease so be prepared with the alternative name the mcq can be on both this leprosy or hansen disease it's a chronic infectious disease which is caused by a bacterium it's a bacterial infection not a viral many people think that leprosy is viral it is not viral it's a bacterium caused the same bacterium called mycobacterium leprae which is also causing uh, you know it, it it belongs to the same family mycobacterium uh, bacterium uh, you know that that is the same family of bacteria causing the tb also now this kind of bacteria transmitted through contact with infected person yes it can be transferred between the people but not highly contagious it's not like you know there is every possible chance of you getting infected being in contact with person but yeah there are possibility of the transmission especially through the respiratory routes maybe you know getting in direct contact with that person yeah but not very highly contagious disease but unfortunately india is becoming the new capital more than 85% of infected population are non infectious more than 99% population has natural immunity to leprosy still the world is seeing more than 2 lakh cases every year this is insane can it be cured yes sir leprosy or hansen disease can be cured by multi drug therapy so if the question says it's non curable it is curable and currently the treatment regime consists of the dapsone rifampicin and the clo clofazimine these are the three most important drugs that we use as mtd multi drug when you have combination of the drugs that's that's what we using to uh, cure the leprosy government of india started the national leprosy eradication program nelp which is a central sponsored scheme why central sponsored see when you when you talk about the health health is a state subject and given health being a state subject that's why most of the schemes that that talks about the health scheme most of the health schemes are always going to be shared between the cost the funding to be shared between the center and the states it it, it being a state subject and that makes sense like under national health mission the government of india started this nelp mission as a central sponsored scheme where funding is to be shared between center and state 60 40 or something like that for special category it's going to be 90 is to 10 ministry of course we are talking about national health mission so what better than ministry of health and family welfare if you go to the question you will see the problem are there with the statement number 2 and statement number 3 statement 2 says leprosy cannot be cured but can be prevented that is not the case no we have multi drug therapy to cure it so cannot be the right answer this this looks too um, you know extreme so if i would have eliminated option number 2 right okay sorry sorry no no we are supposed to figure out which is not correct okay so 2 has to be there so you should eliminate those option that option which does not contain option 2 so 2 is definitely wrong now and we know that yes sir um at least there are chances even first statement is correct yes that is absolutely correct so my answer should not have one as the answer because we have to figure out not correct one na? so kindly eliminate everything that includes one so answer is supposed to be c because second is incorrect even third is incorrect why in third it says national leprosy eradication program is a central sector scheme is it so no sir it's a central sponsored scheme funding if it would have been central sector a whole funding to be done by state uh, by, by the central government but that is not the case it's a central sponsored scheme so i would say this question definitely it was a tough question but you could have eliminated thankfully to the elimination method but be careful this is the only thing you have to be careful about the question is asking you correct or not correct that is the important point you have to keep in your head now sir moving to the question number 94 urban mining what best describes the word urban mining think about it think what could urban mining means can it be about sustainable resource extraction practices uh do do we have in urban areas do we really talk about the urban mining part no sir that is like in cities you don't have the mining kind of thing 
Is it about green manufacturing practices? Manufacturing cannot be considered with mining because mining being primary activity, manufacturing is secondary activity, doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. What about environmental conservation effort? Conservation, environmental mining. Can Do you think any relation between these two uh, doesn't sound good? So my only logical option, urban mining is going to be circular economy activities or initiatives. So right answer here is D. I, how I have calculated it or how I have derived it is based on some logic, some some common sense, some some taking little bit of risk. I will not say it's easier one, but yeah, taking little bit of risk, despite the question being tough, it could still be at least give. We should have given given it a try. But now let me explain you what the urban mining concept is, and if by chance that comes to your in, comes to your paper ahead, you must be prepared with this particular topic. Urban mining. It's a circular economy initiative. How? Urban mining means collecting rare metals from discarded appliances and electronic devices rather from the earth. That's why the name is urban mining. So if you have discarded your rare metals, if you have discarded your electronic appliance or any appliance, so from there, from that, from that e-waste, you know, you, you got your point. So urban mining is done by extracting the, all the important metals from the e-waste that we are creating and that's why because ultimately you are you are what you are doing you are extracting that kind of thing you are again going to reuse it you are recycling it you are reusing it and that's what circular economy is all about circular economy talks about the three r reduce redu uh, recycle and reuse and that's exactly what we are doing here we are recycling the rare earth with that so as to reduce the environmental impact of the mining operations and rare earth mining operations are sometimes associated with local conflicts as well and that's why we try to rely more and more on urban mining we are just interested to get back those rare metals which are which are of not much use for us right now okay that is what urban mining is all about Question number 95 talks about the ECOWAS we already have discussed it once or twice in the previous papers it stands for economic community of the western african states this question is a very important question and you were supposed to figure out which statement is true so if you look at the explanation first try to understand what this ecowas is all about please look at this figure look at this particular diagram in front of you ecowas is actually a regional intergovernmental organization established way back in 75 through the Lagos Treaty. Now, this treaty name is important. You may have a question coming on that. Lagos Treaty associated with which of the following? And they can give you answer as, uh, as you know, something called as Marcos or Ecovas or this or that or some new names or NATO or something like that. So, at least remember, Lagos Treaty associates with Ecovas. Look at the members that they are in front of you. Talking about the members, so there are all these members are part of the ECOWAS, Economic Community of the Western African States. If you look at the map of Africa that is in front of you, this whole map. So this particular portion of the countries are the members of ECO because these are the Western states. That actually includes countries like you have countries like uh, you have countries like Benin. Countries like Togo, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Guinea, Basu, Gambia, Senegal, all these important countries are there. Okay? But look at look at the few countries here. Like even it includes Niger, Nigeria, every, every country is there. Please remember two, three countries which are very important. One is Mali. Mali used to be a member, but Mali is now suspended after the military. So Mali, right now today, it's not a member of ECOWAS. Similarly, Guinea used to be a member. It is no more a member after the military coup in this particular portion. Similarly, same, same story with Burkina Faso. It is also not a part of it right now. So you may have this kind of question as well. Which of the following country used to be a part but not a member right now? 
in that case remember the three name mali burkina faso and guinea please remember the three names as well right now there are 15 members of ecowas with the with the headquarter that is in the capital of nigeria and that capital nigeria is called abuja abuja we have the headquarters of the ecowas very very important part now why this block this intergovernmental group was created objective of the ecowas was very simple creating a borderless region very similar as we have got the european union and the schengen area kind of stuff so this objective was to create a borderless region which is so well integrated so well governed by democratic principles rule of law and good governance that actually you know become a model to look at 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 a global level and for from that perspective inspired from european union and schengen area this kind of region was created i hope that makes sense to you now if you look at the question of the eco ask of course the second statement is very general statement that probably explains the objective here but yes first one you really have to be little careful and cautious because upsc usually tricks you with the treaties they may give you wrong treaty for this particular kind of thing so but here thankfully both statements are correct answer is supposed to be c can i solve it sir at least you can take a risk on that economic community on west african states because it's an economic community think about it think think just think what could be the purpose why any country would make economic community answer is simple to make it more integrated you know more uh, prosperous as a as a together as a borderless region that makes sense to us and yeah with respect to lagos treaty you have to be careful about so yes the question was a medium level question but could have been uh, at least attempted by taking little bit of the risk it's a mix of factual and conceptual next question is very insane it talks about the voice cloning which is the new threat of artificial intelligence imagine what a normal clone is if somebody if somebody has cloned my uh, like ashish malik is being cloned so you are going to see another person as a, who who uh, who is going to look like me that that is going to be my clone voice cloning is somebody very obvious kind of self explanatory uh, uh, word voice cloning is somebody cloning and copying and you know recreating my voice using the artificial intelligence and technologies like deep deep fake and all that so voice cloning through ai has evolved from a mere curiosity but now it has become a concerning technology imagine you have got a call that call resembles your relative voice or your family member and that voice says i am into trouble please transfer this much money i need it emerge uh, you know urgently somebody very close to you and you give them that money uh, thinking that person your relative your friend your buddy your family member is in trouble and later you get to know it was a fraud i mean so far chalo okay fine i i i am not I'm not going to click on the unknown links but how am i not going to trust the voice i know for so long here so many years now voice cloning has really become a big challenge and in fact it's not just about the fraud voice cloning is a big big concern in the music industry recently imagine somebody takes the voice of some famous singer diljit dosanjh arijit singh sonu nigam anybody and use that voice artificially use that voice and put any rubbish lyrics and make it viral you understand the consequences unfortunately india has become a major threat of the ai voice clone scams in fact almost almost i have read it somewhere I'm not sure about the data but somewhere almost one fourth scam almost 25% scams of the voice cloning is happening in india both statements are correct answer is c easy straightforward could have been attempted but please read more and more about the voice cloning voice cloning is probably one of the new threat that associates to artificial intelligence initially it was just done see why and now you say sir why it was created at the first place 
it was created for a very good reason especially uh, for those people who are losing their voice like somebody has got autoimmune disease and somebody is going to lose voice at a certain number of days or month or certain period so at least that person could have saved his her voice and later on using this technology could have communicated with their loved ones by their own voice that was the idea but now look at how and where it has gone right so very unfortunate very very and it's it's happening in india so so many fake kidnappings so many cyber attacks leading to real threats and financial losses and that's happening in india guys it's happening in india in fact 47% surveyed indians as per the report artificial imposter 47% people have admitted they have either been victims or knew someone that have got affected by this so called ai generated voice scam and the rate is almost double than the global average what's happening in india brings us to the question number 97 the question is with respect to international court of justice now one warning before i uh, before i go ahead with this topic see please remember there are two three similar global courts that always going to confuse you for example we have international court of justice number 1 then there is something called as international court of justice other than this we have international criminal court called icc so please be very careful they look very similar so don't get into the fray for example the first statement that i can see says that international court of justice was established by rome statute no sir not at all rome statute belongs to international criminal court not international court of justice and that's where you really have to be careful i am dealing with what particular thing so please remember now again i'm talking we are talking about international uh, uh, you know international court of justice we are talking about the icj so icj was created way back in 1945 by the un charter not the rome statute rome statute belongs to international criminal court which was established recently in 20 2002 india please remember india is not a signatory of the icc but india is a member of international court of justice i am comparing the two so that you can remember the remember the two second thing icj is the only principal un organ not located in new york in fact the headquarters of international court of justice lies in hague that is in netherland it is not in geneva or new york the two most common destinations of the of any un organ body but no in case of icj it is in hague in netherland official languages that we use in the international court of justice is english and french only please remember only two official languages are there member states of the un are automatic parties of the court so by default india is a, is a member of un india by default going to be a member of international court of justice but when it comes to international criminal court remember india is not yet signed that even non un member states can also become party to the icj by simply ratifying the statute of the un charter that's it please remember states have no permanent representatives at this particular court remember also when it comes to international court of justice when you talk about the judges their composition in total in international court of justice we have a total 15 judges every judge is appointed for a term of 9 years elections are held after every 3 years for one third of the seat that is for the five seats does not include more than one judge from one nationality you can't have two indians sitting there as a judge one nationality one judge and who is going to select those judges the the selection process the candidate must receive absolute majority of the votes in both the most important un bodies un security council called unsc plus the unga un general assembly in both these important bodies a person a candidate must have absolute majority of the votes then only he or she can become the judge at the icj once they are appointed there they are there for the next 9 years retiring judges are they eligible yes sir 
even retiring judges are eligible for the re-election. That is again important thing that you need to remember. Please remember the ICJ is International Court of Justice has no jurisdiction to deal with the applications from individual. I mean, it's not like Ashish Malik has any grievance and we are going to go and file a case at the ICJ. No, sir. No individual can file a case over there. No NGO, no corporate, no private entity. Only the states, the government, the countries can go there to represent their case. Not individual NGO or anything like that. But there are some limitations of the ICJ. What? International Court of Justice cannot suo moto take up the cases, can't start any case on its own. It can take up the case only when requested by the states, by the members, by the countries. Also, it does not have jurisdiction to try the individual accused of war crimes or crimes against humanity. Means, if there is any case that talks about the war crimes done by some country or any country who has done some crimes against humanity. For that, these kind of matters, the ICJ does not include these kind of cases or does not has its jurisdiction to these kind of cases, which I probably, I think for sure, it's one of the major disadvantage that actually downgrades the importance of such a, such important powerful body. Imagine, imagine if, if these war crimes and crimes against humanity if they would have been under the ICJ, you can imagine the kind of global control, global stature that body would be having, right? If you look at the question, guys, which statement is correct? Barring the exception of the fourth one, all the three are incorrect because we know the judges are appointed for nine years, not six. Also, the headquarters of the ICJ is in Hague, not in Geneva. And it is not uh, set up or established by Rome, Rome statute. It is established under the UN Charter. That is important. Last one is fine. Last one is correct. Uh, level of the question, tough. Tough question. Barring the exception of few. I mean, obviously, the first one is confusing. Obviously, the second one is confusing. Third is solo easy comparatively and fourth is also easy. But still, there are confusion. So you can take a risk if you are in a position to at least figure out two or three right statements. In case you have absolutely no clue, then better to skip than unnecessarily losing your marks in negative marking. The question was a tough one, but the best way to prepare these kind of question, always to compare, compare ICJ with ICC. Question 98 talks about the uh, National Assessment and Accreditation Council called NAAC. Now here you, you can clearly see it says the NAAC introduces binary accreditation system for higher education institutions. Yes, sir. It is an autonomous body under University Grant Commission. SSC certifies higher educational institutions with a grading as a part of accreditation. I think both very much make sense. If I don't even if I don't go, go into the details, the name itself National Assessment Accreditation, the name itself says a lot. That, that brings to me the very obvious option as A1. Very easy question, very straightforward question that I have here. This is absolutely important, guys. So answer is supposed to be A and it's very obvious. The statement are self-explanatory in their own way. Next question is very important and tricky as well. The question is about two very important reports. One, annual status of education report called ASA report. And another is, all India survey on higher education called the Aisha report. So the key words are these two reports. How much do you know about it? Let's try to figure out. Talking about the ASER report first. ASER is a nationwide citizen-led household survey. ASER report is done and prepared by NGO Pratham Education Foundation. ASER is a nationwide survey but done by an NGO called Pratham Educational Foundation. ASA report is so many times in news, government ignores it many times, but this report is worth studying. It provides the status of the children's schooling and learning, especially in the rural India, star mark included. It talks about the grassroots level learning in the rural India. ASA reports usually refer to the government while formulating the policies and government gets a reality check, like, you know, how education is performing in the, in the country 
and for that purpose for that matter acer report is prepared when you talk about all india survey of higher education the aisha report that is actually published by the ministry of education and ministry of education is conducting this kind of report since 2011 that covers all i mean literally all higher education institutions located in india this is a keyword remember it covers all higher education institution then why where is the problem the problem in the question is the inter exchange of the two statements why and how so it says a sir a sir relates to pratham aishe talks about ministry of education so the two are wrong the two are being inter exchange very simple question could have been attempted because both these reports are in news so many times and both are quite popular when it comes to education in india so yes the answer is supposed to be d neither one nor two and very straight forward question okay do uh, read about these kind of reports and i and i always tell you whenever you talk about any report any index the first thing you need to figure out is which particular organization is associated with that particular last question question number 100 talks about the urban commission what is this urban commission about let's try to understand and it was in news very much in in the news the statement says which statement is not correct about the urban commission first try to understand the context here guys way back way back in 1986 the government of india appointed india's first national commission on urbanization which was given a task of making a study of the various facets of urbanization in india especially all the concerns that the government had in that era concerns about urban planning development structure of the urban local government institutions and what and how india is going to deal with the upcoming urbanization so considering all that facets first national commission on urbanization was made way back 1986 right now it was in news for other reasons recently the government of kerala almost after four decades of this after this commission now for the first time in the last 40 years government of kerala established an urban commission and this commission's 12 month mandate is to address the challenges of urbanization in kerala so you may have this question coming as an mcq which of the following indian state has recently established an urban commission after almost four decades straight forward answer is going to be kerala you may have this question coming right and why this is so relevant and so important for kerala why why kerala needs urban planning urban commission because 90% of the population of kerala is urban population that makes sense why it needs to be fully aware and fully planned when it comes to urbanization both statements are correct not correct is not the case here so answer is supposed to be d neither one nor two are not correct because both are correct guys answer is supposed to be d little bit fact based question i would say yeah there is the the it makes sense it it definitely makes sense uh, what urban commission is supposed to do but yes about the year about the state you really have to be cautious here so i think the question could have been risked at least by you know figuring out and try to recall your current affairs overall level of the question was a medium one but yes be careful with these kind of states and all that and uh, individual questions can pop up from anywhere in this case so i hope guys you have enjoyed and learnt a lot from this particular video if you did then do hit the like button see you guys with the test number 8 very very soon and all my best wishes for the upcoming upsc prelims take care all the best wishes guys jai hind see you very very soon in the next video god bless you